is already 10.30 a.m. on a Sunday. It feels like we just did this, but hey, anybody out there in Facebook land? Anybody coming on yet? I see one, two. We've got a few joining us. Hello, Tammy. How are you? Hey, Tammy. <laughs> well, as everyone starts to join us. Good morning, Don and Shane. Don and Shane, how are you? I miss everybody so much. I'm really, really can't wait for everybody to be in the same building, shaking hands, maybe a hug or two. I don't know. Sue, Clay. Hello, Sue. How are you? Got a few more joining in there. Up, we're up to 14. Hello, Betty, how are you? There's Jeff. What you doing, man? I haven't seen you in a while. You need to come by and see me. All righty. Well, as everybody starts to join in, welcome to High Point Baptist Church Sunday service via Facebook. But this is what we got. This is how we can do it. Hi, Derek. Come and join me. That, that way they'll know you're here. Good morning, family. Hey, our first song this morning is The Power of the Cross. So if somebody else has a phone that you're not using to watch this, you might be able to pull the lyrics up uh, and to sing along. I'll give you just about a minute to do that. Uh, we're going to sing The Power of the Cross here in just a moment. He's going to sing. He's going to sing with me. He's my backup vocals in the background. And if by any chance... Uh, Joe Kimball, I don't know if you're watching. This is kind of your thing to do, but you're not here, so I'm going to throw this in there. If you're watching and you're a visitor and would like to know more about our church, typically we have this little thing here we give to you when you show up and you're a visitor. It kind of has a uh, when we do things, the classes that are going on, and some details about our church. Uh, I can't hand this to you, but if you contact the church, you can um, message us on Facebook. Uh, you can give us a call. What's our phone number? 247. It's probably on here. Was that 247 3106? Or the email address is hpbc1935 at gmail.com. If you want more information, we'll get that out to you uh, in a fairly quick, timely manner. Uh, just let us know. If you want it, we'll get it to you. Let's see who all is on here. We got. We've got a few more. Hey, there's my brother. Hey, Christopher. He's on there. A bunch of you. All right. I'm just stalling while everybody gets on there. So we'll all get to start together. We're, I think we've got three songs we're going to do this morning. And uh, one of these days, uh, we'll have a little organ and piano in the background when we get back to normal. But for right now, I don't know enough about technology to make the sound system work through a phone and a computer, and we don't know what's going to go wrong with our electronics this Sunday, but we're just going to sing. We're going to sing to God, praise Him, and just go with it. That sound good? I hope it does. We're going to sing the power of the cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed 
crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life, finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds, for through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death, life is mine to live, one through your selfless love. This the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost we stand forgiven at the cross. Stay out of my six foot circle. <laughs> Socially distanced. Good morning. It's so good to see you, huh? Like Jonathan. Well, I want to uh, get that hug or that handshake or that elbow rub, <laughs> whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. I'm really looking forward. I don't know that I have ever looked forward so much to taking communion. Amen. I'm ready to take the Lord's Supper as a family together. And uh, we'll have to figure out a new creative way to do that, perhaps. But uh, I do miss you, and uh, I want you to know that I am here for you, and Jonathan is here for you, and we are all here for one another. And, uh, and we're thankful for that. I want to take the time to just welcome you again, especially if you're not maybe a member at High Point, and uh, we're still glad that you're tuning in. Maybe you're watching this two weeks later uh, <laughs> on YouTube. Um, so, Bear in mind that we are uploading these to YouTube, if you didn't know that, after we do them live. And so if you miss something, you want to go back and watch it, you can do that. I want to take a moment, though, to pray uh, with one another. And so let's look at um, the book of, the book, <laughs> the, the, the Acts, not the book of Acts. We've been doing that, but let's look at the, the model of Acts in our time of prayer. You know, pray, maybe by now what I'm going to ask you to do, type in something uh, about the character of God that you adore. Adoration. Uh, something about God's character that you adore. Um, it could be anything. This is not so much what he's done for you. We'll get to that here. But who he is. Tell me something about who he is. Type it in the comments. And, uh, and we want to include that as part of our prayer to God. Remember in the, the model prayer, this is sort of how the model prayer began when Jesus was teaching his disciples, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed 
be thy name. That is a statement of adoration. Um, and so we're starting to get some in. God is a forgiving God. Thank you, Holy. He is forgiving. <clears throat> My volume is too low. That, that's coming from the Kimballs. Let's see if I can speak up a little louder. Or you think we should go on? Creator. God as Creator. All powerful, Miss Birdie says. All powerful. Um, omnipotent. Omnipotent. There is nothing that our God cannot do, cannot accomplish. He's a healer, and He's loving. Amen. Amen. By now you're used to my subpar handwriting. Apologize for that. All right. Well, that's a good that's a good amount right there. He's in control. He's in control. Let me write that one up there as well. He's in control. He's healer. He's loving, forgiving, creator, omnipotent. That's a good start for our prayer. Amen. Um, now we might enter into a time of confession. C is for confession. When we go to pray to him, uh, we certainly need to have a position of humility where we're willing to not just admit. I think we said this last week, confession is more than admission. Uh, confession is to admit without excuse and to, to agree with God what God has said about our actions and our attitudes. You know your actions and attitudes uh, better than anyone else. Except for the Lord. He knows them intimately. And so I don't know if there's anything you want to... I'm going to give you just a second here. If you want to type into confession. Let's see if this will help our volume. Let me just pause from our confession for a moment. Can I get a, a, a thumbs up or a heart if that's better? Or type something if it's worse. <laughs> it may be too echoey. So give me a thumbs up or a heart if that's better. And give me a, a thumbs down or type something if that is, uh, if that is not better. Alright, we got some heart. Thumbs up. Is that a better volume for you? Jeff says too much echo. Vicky says I'm self-centered. Oh, no. no, no. <laughs> That's her. Jeremy says echo. Can we get the echo out? Keep the volume? Hey, we're still live, so that's okay. We've got probably too much echo on that. We're still live. We'll, we'll figure this out along the way. I'm just kidding. So we have self-centered. I, I just saw that typed. Where did I put my marker? Um, and... Just a lack of trust. I think I read that as well. Just a lack of faith. You know, you know, when in that moment and in that trial, you're not believing in him. Um, and you're not resting upon him. We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. So this is good. Um, let me just say, I don't think I finished this while ago. When the church gathers, even digitally, but when the church is meeting, even in small groups though, especially... And people confess sin, that is a good indication that the Spirit of God is at work. Because people do not naturally do that. That is a supernatural work of God to bring us to the point of confession. So, there you go. Okay. Uh, Self-centered and lack of faith. Those are good. You need to confess that. Tell me something for which you're thankful. Something God has done. Maybe he's done this week. Maybe he's answered a prayer. I would love to hear about that. But what is something for which you say, man, I am so thankful for what God has done? If you'll type that into the comments. Let me know you're, let me know you're here. While you're typing that in, we're, we're back on with our mic, trying to give you some volume without echo. What's something for which you're thankful? Thankful for salvation. Sandra, yes. 
Thankful for salvation. Thankful for being an essential employee. That's good. Hey, work. Gainful employment. I think all of you are essential, but that nobody asks me. But I am thankful. Thankful for family and time with them. I think I saw that. And God has afforded us a little extra time with the people that we love. Hopefully, not everybody, but many people. And making me his child. Thankful for food. Amen. Let us receive our food, the Bible says, with thanksgiving. Thankful for High Point Services Online. Hey, I'm thankful for that too. Um, I am, even if it's imperfect. I'm thankful we can do this together on a Sunday morning. And let me just say, uh, just to put a few minds at ease, whenever we go back to meeting soon, we're going to continue this online for a while because we realize that even the first time we do open our doors to a, a, pre a service, you may not feel comfortable, and that's okay. We're, we're totally okay with that. Our comfort levels are going to be different. And so for a while, we're going to have live services in here, back here again, but we're still going to keep the online format for a while uh, so that you don't feel pressure to come back before you're ready. Okay? But man, uh, Miss Gloria, thank you, said, you know, keeping me safe and well. Safety and health. Boy, that's good. Safety and health. Amen. Okay. Um, let's now look at supplication. Supplication is when we Pray for God to supply something. And that's typically when we pray for other people. It could be for ourselves. You know what you need, uh, maybe better than anyone. Maybe you need maybe you need confidence in your faith. You need courage. Maybe you need direction in a decision you're gonna make. But this would certainly be where we pray for our brothers and our sisters. Um, I, I wanna I wanna just give two two real quick. We want to pray for Miss. Margie Hawkins. Margie Hawkins. This is uh, Avon uh, Kimball's mother, uh, Marlowe's um, grandmother, Avery and Ellie's great grandmother. Thankful for family. She uh, was in the hospital. She's back now at Mills Manor, uh, recovering. But, but keep her in your prayers. She did, in fact, uh, contract the virus. And so pray for them and everybody that has somebody in the nursing home right now that is having a really hard time because of not being able to communicate properly, see each other's face. Uh, so pray for Miss Margie. Um, well, we have uh, praying for the salvation of some of our, our country's leaders. Absolutely. We want to pray for our leaders and we want to pray... Uh, for salvation, we will pray for. Uh, we sent out an email last night, Miss Jeanette Bell. Spoke with Richard yesterday afternoon, and, um, and Judy, Richard's sister, Jeanette's daughter, is I think she is in town. Um, I'm not totally sure on that, I, I understood her to be. Um, but Miss Jeanette has not been doing well, she was in the hospital. She's now, uh, what then she came back, I think she's back in the hospital again. But she's been put on comfort care, um, and to be honest, you know they haven't communicated a lot. And, and but we know that she's not in real good shape right now. So please be in prayer for Miss Jeanette. Be in prayer for Richard and Judy as well. Certainly want to pray for uh, Katie Hawkins. Okay, we can uh, add her name up here. And I'm going to put our leaders, as was mentioned, right? Our leaders. Pray for those in authority. And so, uh, and the nursing home residents, absolutely. That's my sister there. Um, all the, the nursing home residents and the difficult time and the staff and, as well. We're thankful for them. Let's go to the Lord um, at this time and let's pray. I'm going to go silent now for a minute because I really want you even if you're alone or maybe you're sitting around the table with four or five other people, I would really love for you to pray through this together. And, and it may take you a minute. You may not get through all of it, but I'm going to give you a minute with all the people that are in the room, especially husband, father, grandfather, if you're in the room, 
if you'll lead your family in a time of prayer uh, through this board. Father in heaven, we, we want to say that we love you because you first loved us and you're an omnipotent creator. You are in control. There is nothing outside of your power. We thank you for creating this world and we thank you for your willingness to forgive, God. You are a God who is slow to anger and rich in mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Father, we confess, God, even in this day and certainly in this week that we've had moments where our faith has failed where we were overwhelmed by uh, troubles, uh, when we should have been trusting in you. We have, Lord, found ourselves consumed with self. Uh, When you have called us to be consumed with you and to serve others, Father, sometimes we think too much of ourselves. I pray, Father, you'd help us to have the mind of Christ, Lord, that was willing to sacrifice his own life so that others may live. Lord, help us to be outwardly focused. Father, we're thankful Thankful for the salvation that you give us, for the health that we are enjoying, Father, for the work. God, for those who are still able to work, thank you so much for seeing fit that they can still go. We're thankful for family. We're thankful for the, especially those who've been able to spend extra time with their family and, and develop some bonds, God, that needed to be developed. Um, thank you for food, for sustaining us. And Lord, we lift up some needs to you, Father. We lift up Margie Hawkins, and I pray, Lord, for her health. Lord, give her strength. Uh, Lord, help her to overcome this virus. And, and Lord, bless her. Uh, Lord, even though she may be alone, I pray, Lord, for those residents and, and also those that are working alongside her, that they would care for her and to love her. Father, we pray the same for Jeanette, Lord, that they would treat her as a child of yours, made in your image. Lord, that they would consider her our sisters in Christ with great compassion, and Lord, medically, God, giving them exactly what they need, Um, and Lord, we pray for health, Father, for both of them. We pray for blessings in the family and peace in their mind and in their heart as we hand over control, Lord, uh, to you. You are the only one that can bring them health. We do, we pray for our leaders, God, of our country, of our, our state, our nation. Lord, those that make decisions, God, we want them, Lord, to be honoring to you, to please you. Lord, to, to, to let that, uh, those decisions be made which leads to human flourishing, Father. And Lord, though we may have different opinions, God, on what that is, we pray that your truth would prevail. And we pray that our brother and sister's lives, God, would be taken into great consideration. Lord, give wisdom, even to those who don't know you, give them a supernatural wisdom that they may govern in a way that pleases you. Pray for Katie Hawkins as well, Father. You know her needs. Bless her, Father, and meet those according to your riches and glory. Father, even as we gather in our homes, God, all over, uh, not just West Kentucky, Father, but all over other places as well, we're thankful for those that have tuned in. We do pray, God, during this time that, Lord, the Spirit of God would lead us. And we're so thankful that you are not confined to a building. Father, we rejoice in that. Thank you, God, that each of us, Lord, as your children, are tabernacles in which the very presence of God dwells. And so, Father, lead us and guide us and direct us during this time we spend together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. We're going to sing uh, Before the Throne of God Above. So, once again, if you have another spare phone or computer, You want to look up the lyrics? I'm not good enough to put them on the computer right now, but 
uh, before the throne of God. We're going to sing that. <laughs> Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written Turn on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness. The great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. We're going to sing another one in a row here? All right. I know they'll know this one, even this if they didn't know the first two. This song is a short chorus. There's four verses to it. God is so good is the first one. He cares for me is the second. I love him so, and then I praise his name. So we'll do that, and then we'll get Derek back up here. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. I praise his name. I praise his name. I praise his name. He's so good.
to, to me. He what? answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to Let's get in our Bibles. Get your Bibles out and go to Ephesians. If we continue to walk through Ephesians chapter 6, we should say we're crawling through Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, one verse at a time. Today we're going to look at one half of a verse because we're uh, uh, giving a special consideration during this time to spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Uh, it has, uh, spiritual warfare is something that in my personal life I know of all the aspects of what it means to be a Christian, uh, to walk the Christian life, it's probably the one been the one that historically I have neglected the most. And probably the, the one that uh, historically in the teaching that I've received has probably been neglected the most. Now, of the four things of our church, right? Word, worship, warfare, and witness. Warfare is a part of who we are and it's part of what we do every single day. We are in a battle. We've already put on some of the armor of God uh, in order to stand against the wily darts of the devil and against his schemes. Uh, we have put on the belt of truth, uh, aletheia. We have put that on to gird up our loins. This shows that we are ready to be in the fight. We have, we have believed the truth. The truth has set us free. And then we put on the breastplate of righteousness. And this is the, the main protection and we have the righteousness imputed to us of our Savior Jesus Christ. We are right and judicially we are right with God because of who Christ is and because of what Christ has accomplished. Christian and only Christian, you have the righteousness of God. So when, when he looks upon you, he sees his son Jesus and for that I'm thankful. We have put a, 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 upon our feet the shoes, the shod for the preparation of the gospel of peace. I told you guys last week that Though I used to think that this was really more evangelistic, I really think that this uh, instead, though, is more about stability. We don't get knocked down because the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has come to save sinners, is, is something that keeps us stable. It's something that keeps us grounded. And remember, that's, that's our goal here is to just stand. Having done all, to stand. And those shoes show that we are ready and we're in the fight. And then we looked at the shield of faith. That is what extinguishes the fiery darts of the devil. We believe. We believe who God is. We believe what God has said. And what we said last week is that spiritual warfare is understanding that every morning, every day I wake up, and really every moment of the day, I have to believe. It's not enough to say that I believed in the past. I believe today. I hope today, where you're sitting, there is a family, that it can be said of you that you are a Christian. You're a child of God. You've turned from your sins. You've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've taken up this, this armor today and are willing to take it up again tomorrow. We have to take these things up every day as Christians. Yes, we have won the war. The victory is ours. But I want to win the battle. I want to please the Lord with all that I do and with all that I say. I want to be holy. Uh, when a person is saved, their mind is changed. And they start to love the things that God loves. They start to hate the things that God hates. And they want to please Him. It changes the entire direction of their life. It's called... Regeneration. God gives us a new heart and he converts us. And I, I hope this morning that you can say with confidence that God has given you eternal life. The fifth piece of armor, and we're only going to look at the fifth one this morning, is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. So let me just start, though, in verse 10 uh, so we can, we can get the broader context. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, those lies that he hurls our way. And this is important this morning, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Let me pray for us again real quick. Father, as we uh, have opened up your word and as we take the time to consider its meaning, God, Lord, what it says to observe it and to interpret it and then mostly and most importantly to apply it to our lives, help us, Father, to understand. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, remove distractions, I pray, uh, so that we can understand your word right. We let it be rightly divided. Let the Spirit of God lead as we share uh, uh, the understanding of this text, and I pray today that for all Christians that they would take up the helmet of salvation. Speak to us clearly, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The helmet of salvation. Guys, coaches know that there are really three kinds of athletes. All coaches know, I think, that there are really three kinds of athletes. It doesn't matter if you're playing with a uh, five- and six-year-old soccer team, if you're playing in the big leagues of professional football. There's three kinds of athletes. There are the underconfident, there are the overly confident, and then there are the appropriately confident. There are those that are dramatically lacking confidence. There are those who are oozing with it, and, and uh, even to the degree of being arrogant. And then there are those, those athletes that I think most coaches want to coach. They want to put on the field that have an appropriate amount of confidence. Let's think about the first one, that the, the type of athlete, we may even say soldier in the case that we're looking at, that is lacking confidence. You know, something that has been an incredibly growing field in the last 30 years, along with really all kinds of psychology, is sports psychology. You may have not known, but there are people that make a living as sports psychologists. And they are typically employed by... Um, Athletes, professional athletes especially, and maybe even college athletes, that are lacking in confidence, and the lack of confidence is beginning to affect their play and their performance. Uh, some people call, uh, call what an athlete gets when they're not confident, some, some people have called it the yips. It's when you know, you're, you're so inside your own head that you're unable to, to just do rudimentary things that you should, as a good athlete, be able to do. Um, even the sports psychologists know that, that when a person doesn't have confidence, it's really a matter of the mind. And so sports psychologists will typically encourage athletes to uh, practice relaxation, relaxation techniques like counting. But they'll also try to get them uh, into reading self-help books and, and to build confidence by believing that they are somebody and, and that they're worthy. The yips, or a lot, lack of confidence, can actually be the end of a career. Uh, is, is actually athletics simply don't work if you don't believe that every time you stand up, that every time you block your opponent in football, that every time you shoot uh, a basketball, if, if you do not believe that it will go in, athletics really just, it, it doesn't matter what sport it is, it just doesn't work. Uh, and it begins to really dramatically affect you. Uh, Rick Ankiel, some of you maybe sports enthusiasts or, or uh, St. Louis Cardinal fans know of a guy named Rick Ankiel who almost 20 years ago uh, was a, a young up-and-coming pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. And he took the mound in the playoff game, and he was only 21 years old. Now, there might be some things to learn from that, but he was just a kid, wet behind the ears, but he was good. And when he took the mound, he, in the third inning of that game, he threw five wild pitches. I mean, he wasn't even close. And that was, looking back, the beginning of the end of his career. Some people say that he got the yips. He, in fact, if you read his story, he hired sports psychologists, and he couldn't get out of his own mind. I know another player, Chuck Knobloch, who was a great all-star player for the Yankees, whom I did not like to watch. He was a second baseman, which is not very far from first base, not very far at all. And he got to where he couldn't make the throw 30 feet away to the first baseman, a professional athlete. And then the more he began to do it, the more it began to snowball, and it affected his mind, and it really spelled the end of his career. So there's that kind of athlete. He doesn't have, he, he's lacking in confidence. Then there's another kind of a, athlete that is oozing in confidence, right? He has too much confidence. We might even say that he's an arrogant player. Now, a lot of coaches are happy to have arrogant players. 
they're happy to have those overly confident players because at least you get the confidence and you get the performance. But what happens to an arrogant player? What happens to an athlete that has too much confidence? Well, it eventually affects his decision making. He ends up making decisions that he really shouldn't make because he's, uh, he's overestimating his own strength, his own ability to accomplish things. And so he takes too many risks. And not only that, when an overconfident player fails, he's always looking for somebody to blame because it couldn't possibly be his fault. It couldn't be his fault that he missed the ball. It must have been the lights. Or it couldn't be his fault that he missed that tackle. It must have been that something was wrong with that guy's uh, pants. I, my hand slipped off of him. It's always somebody else's fault. And an arrogant player may have confidence enough to perform and maybe even perform well, but coaches don't always like to coach them. And people, and they're not always enjoyed as, as people because. They're the center of their own universe. And then you have that third kind of athlete, which is that in-between athlete, right? He is appropriately confident. He's not underconfident that, that it affects his performance, but he's not overly confident in that he's not self-confident. I mean, and, and the best example I could give for this would be somebody like Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow uh, is, it was a great athlete, one of the best college football uh, quarterbacks of all time. He really was. And played in professional sports. And now he's playing baseball in his mid-30s. But no matter how good he does, you will be hard-pressed in an interview to get Tim Tebow to brag on himself. But he's a good person, right? Every coach would want a guy like Tim Tebow on the team because he's going to make other people better and he's not arrogant. And that's the kind of attitude that people want to be around. And that's the kind of attitude that is really required for a great athlete. Not underconfident and not overconfident, but appropriately confident. The, the, the difference between all three of these athletes boils down to their mind. What is going through their mind? If you listen to Rick Ankeel, you'll hear him say that he could not get it out of his mind, those wild pitches. If you could get inside the mind of an arrogant athlete, you, you probably wouldn't want to stay long. I could list a couple of those by name. I won't do that. But there are some people, professional athletes, a lot of them, that are just the center of their universe. But it all comes down to what they're thinking. It all comes down to their mind. That's what brings us, and, and hear me out, we're going to bring this full circle. I didn't just get on here to talk about sports. This brings us to the next part of a soldier's armor, which is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. When we think about the helmet of salvation, there's two questions we need to ask. First, why is it a helmet? That's what we've done with all of these. Why the helmet? Well, we know it's the helmet, not only because it's protective, but it's protective of the head. It's protective of the mind. The mental life of a Christian is of the utmost consequence. It's, a, it's paramount. It is a mind, Christian, you're, you have a mind that because it is so valuable, because it is so consequential, it must be protected and it must be guarded. 2 Corinthians 10. If you want to turn there, you can. If you want to jot this into your margin. Paul is talking about um, the thought life. The spiritual thought life of a Christian. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, ready to punish every disobedience and your obedience and when your obedience is complete. If you listen there, he's talking about thoughts. He's talking about opinions. He's talking about ideas. He's talking about philosophies. Let me say that the Christian life is reasonable. The Christian life is logical. Now, there are some things that, that are beyond our human reason, but, there are, but, but the faith is built on a reasonable foundation, a logical foundation. It makes sense. It is rationally defended. We believe that the faith can be rationally defended. It, Peter even says, make sure that you're ready to give a defense, an apology, a rational defense for the hope that is in you. We don't just say if our faith needs to be explained, or if our faith is attacked, we don't just well, that's just what I believe. It's just, it's just, it's just what I believe, right? No, it's, it's not just what you believe. Why do you believe it? Can you give defense of it? Does it actually make sense? 
that word that we just read, stronghold. That this, this battle that we're in, that, that we, we destroy strongholds. We think about a war, think about what a stronghold would be. It also, some of your Bibles may translate it fortress, right? This is the attack. And this is a place where people would gather. The word, the Greek word, can also be used as a prison or a place in which people reside during war, right? That we attack and destroy strongholds. And these strongholds refer not to physical places that hold people. This is not a physical war. They don't even refer to demons. They refer to ideas. They refer to ideologies. They refer to philosophies. They refer to lies. We attack them, Paul says. We attack them with weapons of warfare because those philosophies, those strongholds are imprisoning people and they are entrapping people who believe a lie. So we are on the offense, offensively attacking them. People are imprisoned by lies and false ideologies. Those people, if not rescued, will eventually be entombed. That word that can be fortresses or strongholds or prison can also be tuned. And sure enough, if people are in the strongholds of lies for long enough, they'll be imprisoned to them and they'll eventually be entombed by them. The Bible also tells us, 2 Corinthians, I think 4 4 says that people's eyes are blinded by the evil one. The eyes are blinded. There is a part of spiritual warfare, is the warfare of your mind, the battleground of your mind, your thought life, what is true, what is good, what is right, what is beautiful. And there is open war. On the battleground of your mind every single day. There is war being waged on how to think, how to think properly or improperly. Spiritual warfare is a fight in the minds of human beings, believers, and unbelievers. We appeal as Christians to unbelievers, we appeal to them with truth, with knowledge, empowered by the Holy Spirit to persuade them. Listen, I love persuasion. Like the gospel is to be used to persuade people. Now we know that only the Spirit of God can change a person's heart and can remove the blinders from their eyes. But what did, what did Paul, at uh, the end of Acts, Paul is, is sitting down in a room all day long in a house and, 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 and the guy that he's speaking to says, Paul, you have almost persuaded me to be a Christian. The, this is what we do. We persuade people. We appeal to their reason. We appeal to the truth. And we call them to, to believe and to take a, make a decision, to take a stand based on the truth. Not an idea, not a philosophy of this world, but the truth of who God is and what God has done. We preach, we teach, we, and, and we don't just preach and teach to others, right? Because well, I'm not a preacher or teacher. We preach to ourselves. We meditate. And so this is going to go right into the next one, which we're going to look at next week, right? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, right? What are we going to set our mind upon? We know what it is. We don't just preach and teach to others. We preach to ourselves, right? One of the failures of, of, of God's people in the Old Testament was not that they never knew. They knew the truth. They didn't remember it. They forgot it. One of the greatest books of the Bible, Deuteronomy, right? It, it, the re repetition there is remember, remember, remember. Don't forget. When Jesus is being tempted by the devil on the mountain after 40 days, he appeals to the Word of God, and he is appealing specifically to Deuteronomy. Why? Because he is remembering in that moment who God is, his Father, and what God has said. We preach to ourselves. We are offensively destroying arguments, opinions, philosophies, because it's our spiritual duty and privilege. That means we call lies, lies. And we call liars, liars. Revelation 21.8, their portion is in the lake of fire. That's, what, that's where a liar's portion is. Right? We take that seriously. We call charlatans, charlatans. We call false teachers, false teachers. We call false religion, false religion. Why? Because we care about the truth. And because false religion, false teaching, and lies are imprisoning people, and we want them out of prison. We want them liberated. The truth will set you free. And your mind is a battlefield every day, and God is... There's a lot of people and a lot of things and a lot of businesses and a lot of demons that are wrestling for property. They want to they camp out up there in your mind. They want to get some acreage and they want to build and they want to settle in. And they want to be a part of the way that you look at everything. And there's a battleground. 
The second question is, we, we, have, we understand why it's a helmet, but the second question is, why is it the helmet of salvation? Why is it the helmet of salvation? Okay, this requires a little bit deeper probing, because um, while the Bible uses the term salvation in three ways, uh, you have been saved, you are being saved, you will be saved. Uh, you and I typically only use it in one way. We typically use the word salvation to refer to a past event. One of the questions we need to ask here is, when he's using the word salvation, the helmet of salvation, is he, is he referring to the past event, the present event, the future event, or kind of all of them all together? Well, I think that if we look at another place where Paul uses the same term, that will help us to decide. Right? This is using Scripture to interpret Scripture. So if you can flip in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians, 5.8. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, also a letter written to a church, also by Paul, the apostle. And he's using similar terminology, except he's expanding on a little bit. And there he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. And so he's talking that armor language again. He actually wrote this before Ephesians. And he says, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For a helmet, the hope of salvation. And I tend to believe, going back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 there, that when he talks about the helmet of salvation, he is specifically regarding the future salvation, that which is in front of you. Yet, Christian, you, you were saved. Christian, you are being saved. But Christian, you have not yet been saved. Not completely. We have been saved from, from, from the, the penalty of sin. Uh, we've been saved from, from the power of sin. We have not yet been saved from the presence of sin. I'm looking forward to that. Right? It's going. It's not around me. The, the effects of sin and the death that come from it, they're all gone. We haven't gotten there yet. We are still people that are awaiting the Savior. We are still awaiting Him to return. The fullness of our salvation. The glorification of our bodies. I think that when He talks about the helmet of salvation here, He's talking about hope. He's talking about hope. The hope of salvation. Not past or present, but hope. That, that, that Greek word apis, no, elpis, I don't know if I'm saying that right. The confident anticipation of what will surely come to pass. I don't, we don't usually use the word hope that way, but that's the way the word hope is used in Scripture. The confident anticipation of what will surely come to pass. Right? This is not lottery ticket hope. Right? One in eight billion chance. Right? What a waste of your time and money. Um, this is real hope, right? I am looking forward to what I am confident will happen. Hope is a matter of the mind before it's a matter of the heart, like most things. Hope is a matter of the mind, of the thoughts, before it becomes really entrenched upon the human heart. Think about what Paul told Timothy. And you know this probably from a song better than you do the scripture. 2 Timothy 1 12, I, for I know whom, finish it, some of you don't know, okay, this is what it is, for I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded, confident, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, right, I know where I'm going. I know that the salvation that I have was given to me by him and is being held by him and that he can surely hold on to it until I get to him. He will hold me fast to the end. I know this, Paul tells a young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed. And so we're talking about a confidence. Going back to those athletes while ago, right? We're talking about a confidence that comes in knowing that our salvation is not yet complete, but it will be. The future salvation is known to Paul and leaves him persuaded because of God's ability to keep him. I know where I'm going. I can reason with you about heaven, about a new heaven and a new earth. There's no more tears, and no more sickness, and no more pain, and no more selfishness, and, and, and no more lack of faith. There's no more, no more preaching um, because we will see him face to face. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. And with hope. Not with lottery ticket hope, but with actual anticipation of what will surely come to pass. 
Now, think about these three. Go, go back with me for a second to those three athletes, okay? The helmet of salvation in terms of spiritual warfare. The person we talked about is that one that has no confidence, right? Every time he steps into the batter's box, he's, he's fearful of failure. He's in his own head. He has the yips, right? He can't do the routine or the mundane because he feels the pressure to carry his team. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, he doesn't even think that he can do it. Think about the Christian who is facing the day's troubles. Maybe this is you, the day's trials, that doesn't have any certain confidence of the outcome. Listen, man, I'd have the yips too. I'd have the yips if I, if I thought I had to carry the team. I'd have the yips every single day if I thought that my eternal home is contingent upon today's performance. I couldn't relax. I would lack self-confidence too. Listen, Christian, and I'm only speaking to a Christian here this morning, but your future salvation, your future salvation has nothing to do with today's performance. There's liberty in that. There's also confidence in that. Your eternal home is not dependent on you overcoming every single temptation. That's good. That's really good news. That'll help you sleep at night. You are not carrying the team. You know the outcome. The outcome cannot be changed. The Bible says you are already, in some ways, seated in heaven. If your Bible's open to Ephesians 6, go back one page. It's one page on mine of chapter 2. And look at verse 5 and 6 of chapter 2. Actually, it's starting verse 4. That's just good. Verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, to grace, or by grace, you have been saved. Verse 6, Ephesians 2 and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God, Christian, do you realize that there's a sense in which like, you are already in heaven? Now, I know you're not in heaven, but you are united with Christ as a Christian. You are united with Christ. He is in you and you are in him. And so there is a very real sense in which you are already there. Your home is sure. It is secure. He is holding you. You're not holding him lest he slip through your fingers. Your future is secure because it's not in your hands. Listen, if, if you're unsure if you are a Christian or if you are deluded into believing that salvation is something that can be lost or forfeited through sin, you cannot wage war properly. Now, I, I'm fully dependent on this. And listen, there's a lot of people that underneath the banner of Christianity that, that say and appeal that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow and saved again the next day. I'm going to tell you what, uh, they're lying to you. They're misusing the scripture. They're abusing the scripture. That is not what the scripture says. But I will tell you this. If I believed that, if I believed that, that if, I, if I didn't uh, straighten up this afternoon, that I might wake up in the morning back a, a, a two-fold child of hell again, if I thought that, I'd have the yips. I wouldn't know how to live. I mean, I'd probably lock myself in a closet somewhere to make sure I, I, I didn't sin. I mean, I, I'd be so scared. And I know a lot of people that are in that kind of teaching that they do live scared every single day. And some of you guys in our church, your testimony reflects that. You, ra you were raised up in that. And now you begin to understand the liberation of, of grace through, through faith in Jesus Christ. That once you become a child of God, he doesn't adopt kids that he unadopts. It doesn't work that way. And when he brings somebody into the family, you are in his hands forever. In times of spiritual warfare discussion, right, we can always run the risk of overly evaluating self, right? We've talked a lot about spiritual warfare, right? That, that's a lot about you. And the, the danger in talking about spiritual warfare this much, like we have, is that you can do too much self-evaluation. You can do too much self-evaluation. Like Rick and Keel up on the pitcher's mound, so scared that he's not going to be able to throw the ball to the catcher and he, and he sells, sells it, right? You can do... Too much self-evaluation. They, they, some people call that par, uh, uh, paralysis by analysis. Right? You can't move. You can't move properly because you're just overly invested in you. Now, it might be a good point to remind you. Salvation isn't about you. Now, you can amen that. Salvation is not about you. You did not initiate it, and you will not finish it. The Bible makes it clear. 
We love him because he first loved us. And it also makes it clear that he will bring to completion our salvation. What he, if he has begun a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. He is the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith. Salvation is not about you. Salvation is not about me. You didn't initiate it. You will not finish it. You were not saved by being a good person, and you will not finish this walk by being a good person. That's not going to keep you in the love of God. It is salvation by grace. You're not the star on the stage. He is, and this is not about your glory. It's about his. There is liberation in that, friend. Christian friend, listen to me. That you would not walk through life like that underconfident athlete, not knowing how, how, how to perform, not knowing how to engage in spiritual warfare because you're so scared, right? Because the devil is all up in your head. The flesh is all up in your head. And you need the helmet of salvation, the helmet of hope, the hope that protects your mind because you know where your final destination is. That liberates you to engage in spiritual warfare with a little bit of courage yielded to the Holy Spirit. Now think about the opposite. Because listen, as with many things, right, we can fall out of balance in both ways. We can be the underconfident athlete, but we can also be the overconfident one. We can be the arrogant one. And I think there's just as many Christians that are living in underconfidence as there is in arrogance and overconfidence. Right? The, the arrogant player, right, every time he steps in the batter's box, he's sure he's going to succeed because he's awesome. He's better than all the other players. He doesn't even have to do his routines. He doesn't even have to practice any longer. Right? His exercises, he's far beyond that. He's too advanced for preparation, too advanced for practice. And so think about that in terms of spiritual warfare. This person is living as if the stakes are low. Now, just because I told you, Christian, that your eternal home is secure does not mean that the stakes are low. And when we take joy in knowing that the, that the victory is ours and that the war is won, when Jesus said it is finished, but there's a lot of battles between here and glory, and I want to win every single one of them. The stakes are still high. They're not low. The, the, over, uh, the over arrogant, the overconfident one says, well, I've got my ticket punched to heaven. The rest is smooth sailing. And instead of being par paralyzed by analysis, right, and, and self-evaluation, the overconfident Christian, he never has any time for self-evaluation. He never takes inventory of himself. Like Paul tells us to in the Bible, he says, you know, hey, examine yourself to, to, to see whether or not you're in the Lord. Right? This guy has no time for self-evaluation, self-examination. Christ's soldiers are not to be lax in their fight against sin. They're not to be lax. There is such confidence that some people may find that they don't even think they need to pray or need to read the Bible. Do you realize like, prayerfulness? I, I, I've heard this several times in my life. I heard it last week, and every time I hear it, it's like a dagger to my gut. Prayerlessness is pride. That's what it is. Prayerlessness is pride. It's you, if you're a Christian, thinking, I, I've, you know, I've got this, or, or I'm not worried about this, I'm not concerned with this. Prayerlessness is pride, right? But the overconfident one says, hey, I mean, we're going to heaven. I don't need to study the word of God. I mean, I don't have time for reading, right? Who does that? I don't have time to prepare in the morning. I mean, I've done this before. I've lived these days before. I've seen temptation before. I'm in good shape. Uh, that attitude even might even go so far as to say that Christian thinking is a waste of time. There's no need to pause. There's no need for discipline. There's no need to read. We'll just, just let God take care of all of it. Guys, that, that is not a Christian attitude. And, and one of the ways you can test to see if you're falling on that side is how eager you are for this to be over with. All right. too, much, too much gravity. All right. We need to end this live stream and we need to crack a joke immediately. Because I don't like to think deep thoughts about Christ and about spiritual life and things like that. It just makes me uncomfortable. And if that's you, then that's you. This is you. Um, that kind of attitude, by the way, really plays hard and, and, and or fast and loose, I should say, with, with temptation. Because you have so overly evaluated yourself uh, or, over, or you're such, such overconfidence uh, in yourself, you don't even take temptation seriously anymore. You, you say to yourself, you know, I can watch that movie, it won't affect me. 
I can hang out with those people. It won't affect me. I can indulge that sinful environment. It won't affect me. Um, and, and let me just tell you, like, if you if you approach life like that, that is foolish. If you actually believe that those places and those activities, and those people, and those television shows won't affect you, right? Because you, you you know where you're going to heaven and all that. That is foolish. That is spiritually arrogant. You know, Proverbs asks, you know, can a man hold fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Right? And the answer is a resounding rhetorical, no, he can't. There's no way. Anything you put in your mind affects you. So, oh, it won't affect me. I'm, I'm stable. No, it does. It affects you. And it's not just lies, guys. You know, some of, some of you may be watching way too much uh, news, especially lately. Too much time on your hands. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. And, and, and by the way, when it comes to watching too much news... It's not just what you're watching. So, well, I watch Fox or I watch MSNBC, right? Even, even throw those out for a second. Forget the fact that, that whether or not it's true. It, there's, more, there's more that matters than whether or not it's true. If you're watching uh, uh, cable television, if you're watching the news every single day, and that news program is critical, critical, cutting down the opposition piece after piece, time after time, then what you're putting into your mind is a steady flow of, of arrogance. You're putting in there a steady flow of condemnation, even if they're right. You, you need to unplug from that. If you think you can watch that movie, you think you can go to that place, and, 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 and you'll be fine. Listen, when I was younger, uh, my dad, um, leading our home well, he, he, uh, he told us, I've told you guys this story before, there's no rating our movies. We don't do that. And I know as a young Christian, I thought that was very restrictive. But it wasn't long before it was my delight. Um, and there are things in my Christian walk in my teen teenage years that when I got in my 20s, I couldn't watch them anymore. Even though I felt liberty to do it when I was in my teens, by the time I was in my 20s and I grew in my faith a little bit more, I, I didn't want to. I, don't, I didn't want to watch that, that humor. I didn't want to watch that stuff. Um... And then now there are things that I watch in my 20s that I won't watch in my 30s. It's not because, and it's not because I feel imprisoned by them. It's because I know my vulnerability. And friends, you need to know your vulnerability. I had a, I had a movie recommended to me last week by a wonderful Christian friend that I greatly trust. But I looked it up, and there was just enough content in it that even if it had a great moral message, I just didn't want to subject myself to it. I don't want the, I don't want the words going through. I don't want the images going through. Guys, and, and listen, I'm... I had spent a lot of my Christian walk thinking I was invincible to certain influences too. Uh, that's spiritually, spiritual arrogance, right? Um, it, it ought to be your delight to filter things out from going into your mind. You are what you eat. You are what you consume. You are what you watch. And you are who you hang out with. And you are who, what you listen to. Now, whether or not you're able to draw a straight line between your actions and your attitudes and the influences that went in, you may not always be able to draw that straight line, but I promise you it is influencing you. The helmet of salvation, the helmet, the, the helmet of our hope says you have a mind that is so valuable, it is worth protecting. You're sure that the war is already won, but don't you want to win the battle? Don't you want to win the battle uh, in yourself? I mean, we, we've, we've confessed some sin this morning, right? Maybe you're battling covetousness. Maybe you know in your own heart that you have a wandering heart that sometimes is coveting uh, or idolizing over things, possessions that you do not need and that God does not want for you. And, and maybe you don't need to go to a shopping mall with, with idle time on your hands, right? You say, well, that's silly. That's not silly. Because you know that if you go and you indulge your covetousness, that it'll eventually find its way out, out of your credit card. And that's just one example. Right? You're struggling with lust, right? It's just not a good idea to just flip through television channels. I think one of the greatest things about cable television starting to fade away, maybe you still have it, is we've kind of removed some of the, the just mindlessly flipping through television shows. I'm so glad that my wife actually kind of led the way in getting rid of that several years ago. And now I never mindlessly flip. If I'm going to turn it on, I'm turning on to watch something specific. Not to just put my mind in a vegetative state and just absorb anything that comes in. What are you, are you protecting your mind? Are you doing that? Do you think your mind's worth protecting? Your thought life is worth protecting. 
Um, we don't want to be under uh, underconfident. Uh, we don't want to be overconfident. We want to be appropriately confident. We, we engage in the battle, we know the victory is ours, but we never pat ourselves on the back. <clears throat> if you will turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, 34. Romans 8, 34, another letter that Paul wrote. Romans 8, 34 through 39. <clears throat> Paul says this, Romans 8, 34. <clears throat> Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now here, here's a question here about hope and spiritual warfare. Tribulation, that's spiritual warfare. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, those are all spiritual warfare. So those are all difficulties and trials and tribulations, right? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. That's some confidence right there. Through him who loved us, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, like when I read that, like I think Paul's like William Wallace. I mean, he's like on the battlefield and I'm like, yes. Like I, I don't know how you can read that and not be like, yes, give me a fist bump. I mean, like an athlete would be just charged up and ready to take the field. Um, that is confidence. Absolutely it's confidence. That passage is a rallying cry for war. That's what that is. Right? There is nothing that can defeat us. We are conquerors. There's a sense of invincibility there. As long as you are tucked in, hidden in Christ. Because you'll see that all that victory yielded to the Spirit comes through Him. You go back through that. Christ died. Christ raised. Christ loved. Christ, God loves us. We conquer through Him. We can't be separated from His love. It's all about Him. But we are victorious through Him. The, the helmet of salvation, listen to me, Christian, is the hopeful assurance in your final destination. The helmet of salvation is the hopeful assurance in your final destination. I know, I know nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That doesn't make me puff my chest out in arrogance. No, 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 no. I'm only saved by the grace of God. But it doesn't make me wither up in fear. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know, you know, what if I mess up. Right? We have, to, we have to avoid both of those ditches so that we do not get out of balance. If you've read the book of Romans, guys, Romans is just this long letter on salvation. It's the, the deepest, theologically, intellectually, the, the deepest letter in the entire book. I mean, Paul is talking about the sinfulness of man and, and the grace of God and the Spirit of God coming and, and what we need. And, and did you know in the book of Romans, he does not get to the first command until chapter 6, verse 11. Five, five and a half chapters, over 100 verses. The first time in the entire book, chapter 6, in the book of Romans, he finally gets to a command. The very first command is a command to think. Mental. Romans 6.11 says, You must also consider, reckon, decide in your mind, implant this fact in your mind. You must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. All of this stuff about salvation. And the first command comes in and says, Think. Think this way. Right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. By the renewing of your mind, Philippians chapter 4, if there's anything good and, and holy and, and right, think on these things. Your mind matters. That does not promote laziness. It promotes vigilance. It does not promote fear. It promotes confidence. And guys, especially in the days of COVID-19, when everybody is telling you the sky's falling and, and there's going to be a new normal and the economy's not going to recover, fear, 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 fear. Um, it has never been more important that you be confident that you know how the story ends. Now, you know how the story ends. The hope of salvation. The helmet of salvation. I will not let fear and doubt creep into my mind about what the future holds. I know who, whose I am, and I know who I belong to, and I know what he has said. I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him 
against that day. The helmet of salvation is the hope that protects your mind. Your eternal life is not dependent on your performance today. Praise God. It's dependent on the performance of the Son in whom you are hidden. And He performed well. He performed perfectly. And yet, still, we're vigilant. We put the helmet on to protect our mind. I have, I have a few questions for you because I want to do this. I want to make sure you guys are doing this at home, especially if you're sitting here as a family. Maybe it's just one or two of you. Maybe it's just a husband and a wife. Maybe your kids are there. I want to ask you a few questions. And these are questions that I want you to reflect on when we close here in just a minute. <clears throat> Do you find yourself out of balance? All right. Well, in, what, in what direction are you more likely to fall out of balance? Is it the yips, right? The underconfident, scared, I'm going uh, to upset uh, God, and, and I'm going to make him mad, and, and I'm going to do something wrong. Rise up out of, scare, out of bed, scared to displease the Lord. You let your failures and you let your sin, you let your failures and sin distance you from the Lord, right? Because you shrink back in shame, and they distance you from the body of Christ. You, you start separating yourself, right? Because you messed up. You feel shame and guilt piling up. Shame and guilt that Christ already nailed to the cross. Do you fall out of balance on the ips, right? On the underconfident? Or do you do you fall out of balance the other way? Maybe that's something you confess to the people in the room. Maybe you'd ask them to pray for you. Maybe you fall out of balance the other way. Maybe you fall out of balance toward arrogance. I'll be fine. I've done this a million times. I won't succumb. I don't need to guard my mind. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to fill the mind with what's wholesome and edifying. I, I'm not worried about doubt, fear, or selfishness creeping in. You know, I can handle that movie. I can handle that, that place. And the confidence you have is not confidence in Christ. It's confidence in you. Is that the way you might tend to lead, right? Do you know that you're the Lord's and the outcome is certain, Christian? Do you, with overconfidence, subject your mind to all sorts of spiritual darkness? Christian, you are a child of God. Heaven is secure. Christ will keep you. But you still got to put on the armor. You still have to protect the mind. Listen to this. The last verse I want to read to you it comes from Isaiah 26 3. You will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Your mind matters, your thoughts matter. There's strongholds being built up there, sometimes by the enemy. They need to be demolished. And you need to use the word of God to tear them apart. Here's some homework for you. Talk about that imbalance amongst yourself. That, whether it be the underconfidence or the arrogance in terms of your spiritual warfare. What are some things that you can use to fill your mind with reminders of hope? So, well, somebody told you years ago that about heaven. But have you, have you, have you read up on it this week? What are some things you can use to fill your mind? Brothers and sisters, we guard the things that are most precious. Is your mind precious? Is your thought life precious? Then maybe ask, ask yourself as individuals or as a family, how can we guard it better? How can we protect it better? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Do you know that you know that you know that you have inherited eternal life through faith in a risen Savior whose blood was shed for you on Calvary? Do you know that? If you don't, Let's talk. That's why you're not confident. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a phone call. Let's sit down with one another. We'll socially distance in the Walmart parking lot. We'll park our cars six foot away from each other. We'll pray together. We'll look at the Word of God. You can know that you have eternal life. And if you don't, if you're listening this morning, you've been listening to this whole thing. I've been, I've been talking to Christians this morning. But you still, you know that this is not you. You can trust in the Lord as your Savior, and God will save you because His blood is greater than all of your sins. I'd love to talk to you more about that as well. 
Salvation, forgiveness of sins is possible through the Son of God. He can give you a hope in heaven. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be with you. It's good to look at the Word with you. And we're going to close this morning, as always, with a song. Everybody at home can join with me. I'm going to sing the doxology. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Love you. Love you. Have a conversation around around the family and then y'all close in prayer. See you next week. See ya.